excited to be in the house of the Lord. It is Resurrection Sunday, and we're so grateful we can get up because he already got up. And right now, I invite you to stand up on your feet and join us in musical worship. We get the opportunity and the esteemed pleasure to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So this morning, we're going to start back on Friday because without the cross, there's no resurrection. So we're going to start with the blood that he shed for you and the blood that he shed for me.
his name just for a moment
Come on, worship him, worship him. Worship him, come on, worship him. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's Resurrection Sunday, worship him. Ah. Ah, we were made to give you glory. We were made to give you glory. many of you know that we were made and created to worship him if, if, if you're ever in doubt if you're ever in doubt Lord what should I be doing what 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 is my purpose what should I what should I do the one thing that you can the one thing you can tell yourself is that I was made to worship him and instead of asking Lord what should I do just start worshiping him just start worshiping the king. I promise you he'll talk to you. And he'll let you know. Father, in the name of Jesus. We know, Lord God, that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so we thank you and we praise you. And we honor you and we count it a privilege, Lord God, 
to be here worshiping you on this Resurrection Sunday. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that we can worship you in victory. We can worship you knowing, Lord God, that at that time, your disciples, they were nervous. They felt lost. And the devil thought he had won. But Lord God, in the name of Jesus, on that morning, you got up. You got up just like you promised you would. Just like, the, just like the prophet said that you would. Just like the word said that you would. You got up. And not only did you get up, you got up with all power in your hand. All power and authority, Lord God, belongs to you. And you've given us that resurrection victory power. Lord God, we know too one day we will be with you eternally, Lord. We thank you for this. We thank you, Lord God, that we can stand before you as a victorious people. We can stand before you as an overcoming people. We can stand before you, Lord God. As your sons and daughters, we thank you for this. We pray right now in the name of Jesus that as people worship you all over the world, Lord, that you would receive our worship, that you would receive our praise, Lord God. If we worship you all night and day and day and night, it would not be enough. And so we're grateful, Lord God, that you have assigned angels to bow down and worship you 24-7 saying holy, holy, holy is the Lamb of God heaven and earth filled with your glory and so in the name of Jesus we pray that you would just continue to have your way today continue to receive all of the worship and all of the praise Lord that we offer up to you Lord God and Lord at the end of the day we pray that some will be saved some will be delivered some will be set free but Lord God bottom line you'll be glorified and magnified and we give you all of the praise and it is in Jesus name that we pray and do give thanks and all who agree with that prayer in the name of Jesus said amen Hallelujah. Amen again. Come on, give him praise as you're seated. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, this is where everybody come. Come on, somebody say amen. Uh, we, we, I think we're going to see who the winner is. Is it, is it the 6 o'clock service or is it the 8 o'clock service? Amen. Or is it the 10 o'clock? Oh, come on, 10 o'clock. Y'all packing the house. And it's, it sounds like you guys came to worship the king. Amen. How many of you came to worship the king today? Ah, uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, y'all know what time, where are the kids? Where are the kids? Where are all the kids? Let me see, where are the kids? I know we got kids in here. Oh, yeah. There you go, there you go. Come on up, come on up. Now, right here, you guys know y'all sat here to be a part of this Victory Tunnel. So go ahead and put the tunnel up for our kids. If our kids aren't celebrated in any other place, they're going to be celebrated here in the house of God. Come on, give God praise for our kids. Give him praise. All right, kids. All right, kids, we know you are ready to go learn Jesus on your level. Come on, let's get him a real big ready. Are you ready? Yeah. I think that was loud. Can y'all beat that? Are you ready? Yeah. On the count of three, one, two, three, go, 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 go. Church mother in a church hat clap, man, that sugar gave her color purple, coming back clap, uh, when that whole week beat you up and stress you, but you hear that organ playing and remind you of your blessings. Today is the day that I love to celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. It's what it's all about. 
Well, hey, we are so glad that you're here today. And um, here, just turn to someone around you and say, yay, you're here. Let them know. Say, yay, you're here. Awesome, awesome. Some of you are a little introverted and you're freaking out right now because you're like, do I have to keep talking to people? Uh, here's the deal. We've got some people that are still standing in the back. And so what would be helpful is if you can love the one you're with, all right, and then kind of slide to the middle if you can so that people can free up seats on the end. And uh, we want to help people be seated. So, man, it is so great to see everybody here today. Like, this is awesome. Y'all look good, too. Um, and uh, man, I, I was shaking hands with some people. A few of you showered, too. Like, you smell good. So, man, this is awesome. We are so thankful that you're here today. We have a few folks that uh, haven't come before, some people that have come for the first time in a long time. And um, I got a name of three people that are here for the first time ever. And I want to welcome Lori, Myra, and Cassandra, and any other first time guests. Let's give it up. Say, yeah, Woo! we are so, so glad you're here. Um, you're a big deal to us because we believe that you're a big deal to God and um, you were created in his image. And so whatever skin tone, ethnicity or culture or language that he provided you with, you helped us get a better picture of who he is today. And so this is a church where everyone is welcome, where nobody is perfect and where anything is possible. And if there's any days that we can say anything is possible, it's on the day that we celebrate that Jesus died on the cross and then he rose from the dead. Who does that other than Jesus? And so anything is possible with Jesus. So uh, turn to someone around you and say, anything is possible with Jesus. Let him know. Anything is possible with Jesus. And um, man, we are thankful that you're here. And um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Michael. I am one of the pastors here. And if you're a guest with us, or this is your second or third time, and you're like, how do I take a step to get connected? I'm going to just invite you to, to, there's some in the seat back pocket in front of you, there is a little blue card. And a first step could be simply to lean forward, grab a little blue card, pull it out and fill out your information. It says you on one side. It's like, hey, we want to get to know you um, and help you connect with God. And so all you got to do is fill that out and then give it to one of our team members or there's boxes in the back. There's little white boxes where you can put in stuff like that. Um, but honestly, we are so, so thankful that you're here today. And um, that we are a church where we believe that God has placed us at this time and place to experience the love of Jesus and to share it with the people around the world. And so we try and make the last words of Jesus our number one priority. The last words of Jesus, just before he would finally ascend into heaven, was recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And for us, and for what Jesus was saying, he said, hey, that's right here, that's nearby, that's in, in hard places, and then in faraway places. And so we're a church that believes that we are called to share the love of Jesus here, near, hard, and far. Here in Waldorf, near in Metro D.C., in Southern Maryland, in hard places with people that have just faced difficult situations and circumstances in life and then to the ends of the earth. And I'm excited because you all do this and you get this. Just this past week, we uh, had distributed food to people in our community that were facing food insecurity. And our Easter meal distribution with a, either it was a turkey or a ham and then all the sides and all the fixings, over 50 families are having an Easter meal because of your generosity. So man, we praise God for that. We are a church in the community of the community. And right now, uh, some of the churches that we've partnered with are having their worship services in, in the community, in Brooms Island Community Church over in Calvert County, uh, over at Avert Church, and then uh, Real Church. And so there are some churches that we're partnering with to make a difference in Metro D.C. And also something pretty cool that's happening today, or actually happened this morning, Many of you know that we partner with a ministry in Haiti. And if you've watched the news lately, Haiti is being overrun by evil in some certain parts and some certain cities to the point where the U.S. decided to remove all U.S. citizens from Haiti because of the violence that was taking place there. Jesus and the presence of his light and love is desperately needed in Haiti. 
We've been partnering with a, a ministry called God's Vision for Haiti in Lakai. And they've got some aims and goals. They've actually been putting orphan children into Christian foster families. Uh, some, Many of you are sponsoring children there. And we've actually packed up Christmas shoe boxes and sent almost 600 boxes to children in the community there. So they've got some different goals and aims. And they've been praying about bringing a spiritual presence, not just being the hands and feet of God, but also the Word of God. And so today they had their very first Puen La Via Life Point Church Easter Resurrection service in Lakai, Haiti this morning. This morning. And uh, man, uh, so, some of you, some of you asked me, hey, how was the six o'clock service this morning? And uh, I was surprised. We, there was like 25 of us that huddled in the foyer to like pray at 540. And I was like, it might just be us. And uh, a lot of y'all came and they got to be part of an amazing treat. Um, they, we got to actually, because of technology, God's grace, and some really talented tech people, we were able to zoom in to the very first Haiti worship service this morning. <laughs> It was so good. It was so good. So, uh, so the way they hooked it up, they were in their worship service. We got to pray with Juska Lazar, and then uh, they prayed in Haitian Creole over us that God would do His work in and through. And so it was awesome. I know we're in double digits now. You're the ten o'clock crowd. Uh, the early bird gets the worm. The early bird got to Zoom this morning. So it was it was awesome. And uh, so we're a church that's in the community for the community all wanting to experience the love of Jesus and then share it with the world around us. And so I'm excited about that. I'm excited about you. And I'm excited about what God wants to do in us and through us this morning. So, hey, let me pray and we'll get to work. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us and for meeting us where we are. And thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you have yet to do in us and through us. And so, God, we lift up these other churches and communities around our, around our county and around Metro D.C. and around the world. And, God, we want to be people who partner with you in what you're doing to bring love, grace, and truth to a world that desperately needs it. So, God, I pray that you continue to speak to us. You've spoken to us through lyric and through perhaps one another in the foyer or the parking lot. You've spoken to us through prayer. And now, God, I ask that you would speak to us through the holy words from heaven for us and to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to think to the last moment where you had a thought in your head that was something along these lines. Did that just happen? Like, sometimes we think of like, did that just happen? Sometimes you think of something like awesome that happened. Like, you got the job that you did not think that you would get, and you're like... Oh, did that just happen? Uh, some of you, you landed a contract that you would never think in a million years that you would land. You, you Someone else was competing and you landed and you're like, what did that just happen? Or, or maybe this has happened to you where you did not study one bit for the test and you got a really good grade on it. And you're like, oh, did that just happen? How many of you had a moment like that? You're like, yeah, that, I didn't study, but did that just happen? Or, or maybe you won something that you didn't think that you would win. I remember I, I was in college and I called the radio station. It was like ticket, you know, like caller number seven. And I got, I won tickets to a free concert. And I'm like, what? This is, did that just happen? Maybe others of you, you've gone through, uh, you've gone through some medical things and maybe cancer and maybe you got the report and they're like, hey, you are cancer free and you're like what did that just happen it is just awesome so think about that moment for a moment that that moment of did that just happen but you know this not everything is awesome all the time and there are moments when tragedy strikes and we're left with oh did that just happen being diagnosed with cancer oh did that just happen a relationship that was important to you suddenly was disrupted and came to a clear and decisive end. Oh, did that just happen? Or a family member dies unexpectedly. Did that just happen? You feel it? If you took all of those emotions of our collective experiences, did that just happen? And you put them all on one page, you'd probably find yourself in John chapter 20 of the Holy Scriptures. 
See, what just happened was something they didn't think would happen. Jesus, the followers of Jesus, were following Jesus. He was their friend, their mentor, their teacher, their rabbi, and would soon be their savior. But they couldn't put all the pieces together. And as they're following him and he's washing their feet and they've seen him do some amazing things that some of them saw him walk on water. Some of them saw him feed 5,000 families with a little boy's sack lunch. Some of them saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. Some of them had communion with him. And then what the unthinkable happens is that he allows himself to die on a cross the way criminals would die. He allows himself to be crucified. Now, some of you are like, wait, I thought it's Easter. Okay, it is. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. We don't have a raising from the dead if we don't have death on the cross first. And so Jesus goes to the cross. Of his own accord, he allows this to happen, which is crazy. We have the the Son of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who holds all things together, actually being held by nails. Made from the metal that he created. Holding him to a tree that he created. Nailed in by a Roman guard created by him and in his image. Why? Why? Why would Jesus allow blood to be spilling from his wrists and from his forehead and from his ankles? Why? One word. Love. Incredible love for his followers and incredible love for you and for me. In the way that Jesus, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth, and then we turned our backs on Him, and each went our own way, and then Jesus comes through the Virgin Mary, Merry Christmas, and and comes in and enters the sinful world of humanity, though He is without sin, and dies a death on the cross because He's the only one perfect that a blood sacrifice could cover your sins and mine for all of eternity because of love. So we know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life with him. That Jesus came for you and for me in love. And, and we know this, that that's not the end of the story. But if you can put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of those first followers of Jesus and watching the leader, the teacher, the mentor, the, the miracle maker, the, the giving sight to the blind, the chain breaker, the way maker, dying on a cross. And you're left with, did that just happen? Did that just happen? And Jesus did this on his own. He wasn't forced to. In, in John chapter 10, it's, he, he says, he goes, I lay down my life of my own accord. No one takes it from me. I lay it down. Why? Love. Love and love alone. But aren't you thankful? That's not the end of the story. Aren't you thankful that that's not the end of the story? That he didn't stay dead But because of the power of God through the person of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, he rose from the dead. This is crazy. The the followers of Jesus, Jesus' mom and a few of her friends, they go to the tomb to pay their respects to Jesus' body. And they show up and there's no body. Nobody was expecting no body. They show, they're like, wait, no, we weren't expecting this. And then Jesus, he's off to the side and he starts to talk to them and have a dialogue with them. He's like, hey, I've risen. I've risen from that, just like I said. And then he says, go tell the other disciples. They go tell the other disciples. And this is crazy. These women who are eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus are their very first evangelists and the first testimony eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus, the first messengers of the gospel are these women. They go to the disciples and tell them like, uh, ah, okay. That's probably the response because in that culture, it was a very patriarchal culture. Women couldn't even give an eyewitness testimony in a court of law if they saw something happen. So these women come, the first evangelists, the first messengers of the gospel. Well, let's fast forward to that evening, that very evening. So this all happens in the morning. In the evening, we pick up in John chapter 20. 
So hear what's, what's happening right now. What, that, that there is all of this. Did this just happen? Did Jesus die? Did Jesus rise? And then it says this in John chapter 20, verse 19. When it was evening, on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked. With the doors what? Locked. Because they feared the Jews. What's happening here? Well, the Jews were actually the architects behind the murder of Jesus. And they figured that if they can kill the Messiah, the chosen one, the sent one, they're coming for us next. So they're fearful. They're afraid. They lock themselves in. This is Sunday night. And they're like, what's going to happen? They are afraid. How many of you have ever been afraid? Let me try this again. How many of you are breathing? I'm not afraid. Okay. How many of you have ever felt stuck before? It's like, I'm not sure what I should do here with this relationship, with these finances, with my future, with my health, with that kid. And what's fascinating is the next two words. Jesus came. Jesus what? Came. One more time. Jesus what? Came. came. They were afraid. They were locked in isolation and Jesus shows up. And I believe, friends, that that same Jesus who showed up to these scared disciples wants to show up in your life as well. Whatever area of your life that you're feeling stuck in that relationship, with that money, with those bills, with those kids, in that job, you just wait on Jesus and He can show up. If the door is locked, if you feel stuck, if it feels impossible, He is coming for you in love. There's nothing too hard for, that, for Him. So it says that Jesus came, stood among them, and... S- now just think about that for a second. You're locked. The doors are locked. You're like, oh man, are we going to die next? And then Jesus, who you last saw, was like this and then like this. Just, what's up, y'all? I don't know if he did this, but it does mean peace. Which is what he says. He says, peace be with you. Which is exactly what he needed to say. They're like, oh, what? Peace. Peace be with you. I don't know about you, but if you've ever been afraid or ever felt stuck, you needed two things. You needed peace. You needed to know that you were not alone. And you needed peace that you couldn't find on your own. And you also needed something else. Watch what Jesus does here. He says, peace be with you. He gives them peace that, that they couldn't get anywhere else. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Do you hear the contrast of emotions? They're afraid. Jesus says, peace be with you. What? Yes. They're probably, oh my, Jesus, it's you. You're here. This is amazing. This is incredible. They're absolutely beside themselves. They rejoiced. But then Jesus says something to them again. You know how like on a text message when you can like swipe to the side and it'll tell you like when it came through, like what the time is. I wish you could do that with the Bible, but you can't. I don't know how much time went from the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord to Jesus said to them again. Jesus said to them what? Again. What's he say to them? Peace be with you. What happened? Why would he need to say that again? Maybe what happened to them is exactly what happens to us. That we're like, oh, no, this is not going to work out. Oh, thank you, Jesus, you're making it work out. But what if it doesn't work out? What if there's a a few minutes between them worshiping? Maybe they busted out into a worship service, and and then all of a sudden they're like, wait a second, he's alive. What if they come and kill him again? And what if they kill us too? What if, oh, now I'm afraid again. And Jesus says to them again, peace be with you. Sometimes... We have to hear what God says to us more than once, more than once. So he gives them peace. And then he says, peace be with you. And he says this, as the father has sent me, I also send you. You know what? When we are trapped in fear, we need not just peace. We need purpose beyond the moment. We need something to live for because we feel like what we're in is about to kill us. 
And we need purpose beyond ourselves. And so Jesus says, hey, peace I give to you, but as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus uses this term sent in John's gospel alone over 14 times. Where he says, I'm sent to you, I'm sent to you, I've, been, I've sent to you, and now I am sending you. He gives them purpose that they could not get on their own. And when some of you are wondering if you should set your alarm tomorrow morning, or you don't feel like going to work on Wednesday, you need to know that the fact that you're still breathing says that God... God is not finished with you yet. Turn to someone around you and say, God is not finished with you yet. Tell them, let them know, God is not finished with you yet. If you're still breathing, God is not finished with you yet. He has purpose. He has a divine direction for you to fulfill. And He wants you to be focused on Him and focused on His mission for your life. And after saying this, He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. It's interesting when God breathes on people. He actually breathed on people in the very first page of the scripture. When God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth and he creates humankind, the scriptures say that he breathed his breath of life into man's nostrils. I wonder if here in this moment, if Jesus is breathing a new story, a new creation, a new peace, a new purpose, and a new mission that could only be given by King Jesus. It says, if you forgive their sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Jesus is essentially saying, hey, if people reject Jesus, they are refusing forgiveness. Because only someone pure and holy like God could forgive you of your sins against God. And then it says this in verse number 24. But Thomas. But who? Thomas. Thomas. Let's read this verse together. Verse number 24. But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. What? Where is Thomas? There was these books, Where's Waldo? You gotta like find him. There should be one like, Where's Thomas? Like, where was he? How could you miss this? What, what could possibly be more important than being in the presence of the literal resurrected Jesus. Where was he? Was there a Black Friday sale that he was at? Was he out shopping for new Easter shoes? Where is Thomas? I mean, he missed the most important moment in all of human history, which involved the most important person in all of human history, and he missed it. Where was he? Well... We, the scriptures don't tell us. And then verse 25, it says, So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, If I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Sounds like Thomas is a straight shooter to me. I know he's got kind of a bad rap. He's called Doubting Thomas. I think Thomas is just curious. Thomas is actually probably a lot like you and me. Let me find out who's in the room. How many of you, uh, you're like, you've kind of got a gut reaction of something and you're just going to go with it. Like you just, you go with your gut. You've got a sense. You've got like a, ooh, I, I feel like this is the right thing or this is the wrong thing. And if it turns out to not go well, like you'll just go back to your gut and be like, hey, we'll just do this instead or we'll figure. How many of you are like kind of gut reaction kind of people? Like you can be a little spontaneous, go with it. All right. How, how many others of you are like, now nah, I'm going to read the reviews. I'm going to do my research. I need a spreadsheet. How many of you? Come on, put your hands up. Yeah. See, there's some of you when it comes to like the pool get together, you're jumping. You're, you got like, you're jumping off the side. You're doing a cannonball like, whoa. And then you get hypothermia. Like, ah, oh, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Others of you have a little bit more of a Thomas temperament. You're like, uh, who no, 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 I am not. I don't know what's wrong with y'all. I am not doing that. Like you're going to do all the research. You're going to read all the reviews. And that's a little bit like Thomas. Thomas, he's like, I, he's a see it to believe it kind of a guy. He's, he's like, I just need to see it to believe it. I, I need to touch the nail marks in his hands. I need to put my finger there. I need to put my hand in his side. Now, the disciples telling him, we've seen the Lord. The next verse says, a week later. Okay, what was that week like? 
for Thomas? Have you ever like been around somebody, maybe some office co-workers or some classmates, they all went to do something that was awesome and you didn't get to go? Either you were uninvited or you were not included or you didn't get the message in time. They're all talking about it and you're like, shut up already. Like that's just stop talking about, I don't want to hear about it anymore. La 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 la. Unfollow. I don't want to see you post about it anymore. I'm done. Like I, I just wonder what those 168 hours were like for Thomas. And I don't know if he's getting annoyed with everybody talking about how awesome it was to see Jesus. Let me just say something. Some of you are here today and, and you might have more of a Thomas temperament. Maybe you are someone or maybe you were someone or you know someone that comes from more of a see it to believe it kind of a perspective. And if that's you, I just want to tell you, we are so glad you're here. Maybe you're coming today because you get free lunch with whoever invited you. You're like, hey, I'll come for, uh, I'll get dressed up if I can eat some food with you. That would be great. But if you're here and you don't quite believe in Jesus yet, I just want to tell you, we are so thankful that you're here today. We are so thankful that you're here today. And I get it. You might be a seed to believe. And you might actually be annoyed with the people who keep telling you, I saw Jesus. I saw him in his word. He showed up to me in the grocery store. It was amazing. I, and you're like, okay. All they're doing is exactly what Jesus told the disciples to do. Go tell them about the Lord. Go tell them that you've seen me. So they might be annoyed. They just want you to know the same peace and the joy that Jesus offers to anyone who trusts in him forever and ever and ever. And a week later, his disciples were indoors again. And catch this. And Thomas was with them. He was with them. No more shopping for Easter shoes. He was with them. And let me just say, if you've got a Thomas temperament, I just want to invite, you might not be all into the Jesus thing, uh, but let me just invite you to be around people who like to be around Jesus. And maybe he'll show up for you when he shows up for them. I get it. I get it. We're annoying. I get it. We're weird. We believe in something we can't see. But if you're online or on campus, I just want to invite you to be around the people who are around Jesus. And I get we're weird and I get we've, we've hurt people along the way and, and done things out of pride and insecurity and feelings of inadequacy. But Thomas was not going to miss it. He wasn't going to miss round two. He wasn't going to miss it this time. What, what happens? It says this. It says, the doors, even though the doors were locked. I'm like, again? Like, really? Again? And then it says this, two words. Jesus came. Jesus What? I'm not sure if I said this earlier or not, but if the doors are locked and you feel stuck, Jesus can show up and do the impossible when things seem impossible. He can feed 5,000 families with a little boy's lunch. He can use your gifts and multiply ministry to change the world. Jesus came in the same way that Jesus came for them. I believe that for some of you, perhaps all of us, Jesus is coming for you in love. He's coming for you in love. He wants you to experience His peace and His purpose. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I wonder if He just locked eyes with Thomas. Peace be with you. What if He just locked in? We don't know. It was for everybody. Everybody needed it. They were still locked. They were still stuck, or so they thought, even though they'd been sent. And then he said to Thomas, pause, what would you say to Thomas? Thomas, Tommy, Tom, Tom, what's up, bro? Man, you really like Thomas, you were there when I raised Lazarus from the dead. You missed that. I mean, did you forget that? Thomas, you were the guy who asked me, hey, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. And then we said, well, how can we get there? And you asked me and I told you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas, I told you that. Thomas, weren't you there when we, when all those food then, when we healed blind people? Like, weren't, Thomas, what would you say? If you were Jesus to Thomas, Thomas, we went over this in Sunday school like lots of times. You walked with me for three years. We sang about this. You were there when we had the Passover meal. And I, Thomas, I washed your feet. Thomas, did you fall asleep during that sermon? Or all the sermons that I, what, Thomas, 
Jesus does none of that. I'm glad that he is God that I'm not. I would totally mess it up. Amen. Tom, then he said to Thomas, he doesn't say what's wrong with you. He doesn't say where you been. He says, Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Do you hear what he says? He invites Thomas to take a step in his faith. He says, Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. You know what I, I get from this? Is that Jesus actually invites partnership. He invites relationship. He invites connection. He, he says, put your... See, peace, peace is passive. It's something we get. Purpose is active. It's something that we do. And here in this moment, he could have said, Thomas, hey, just believe. But he actually invites Thomas, reach out. He says, put your finger here. There's, there's an action or responsibility or free will that Thomas gets to live out. Put your finger here. Look, reach out. And I believe that God does that with us as well. That He, he invites us to have faith in Him. And we reach out for Him and we find out simultaneously that He's already reaching out for us. He's reaching out for you. He's coming for you in love. He's not finished with you yet. And so Thomas, I don't, and we don't know, I don't know if Thomas, he was like, oh, okay. He's like, pushes in. He's like, I want to see the other hand. Pushes the other. I don't know. We, if he lifted up the robe, he's like, let me see this. We don't have a record of what Thomas actually does. But we know that Thomas responded. We know that in this moment, Thomas responds. Now, some of you would look at this and say, don't be faithless. Well, was Thomas faithless? Are you faithless? Am I faithless? Here's the reality. All of us, all of us practice faith every single day. Every time you get in your car and drive down uh, the road, you are exercising faith that the vehicles around you are not, they're actually going to obey the lane signals or the stoplights. You have great faith when you walk into the grocery store that someone in there isn't out to kill you. You have really great faith when you go to a restaurant or an eatery and people that you've never met and you're not sure if they showered or not, if they're, they're making your lunch. And like, I'm not sure how... That's faith. If you eat school lunch, you have incredible faith in the name of Jesus. I mean, you have faith. When you came in here, the, you exhibited faith coming in and having a seat. Uh, you're like, well, no, I've, I've, I mean, it's... It's verifiable. It's historical. There's eyewitnesses. But, but you exhibited faith. You didn't flip the chair over, check all the screws, make sure everything was tight. You didn't say, hey, you sit in it first, and if it holds you up, then I'll get in it. You didn't do like, well, you didn't like, oh, let me see if it'll, if it'll hold me. I'm not sure. You sat down. That exhibited faith. Now, you would say, well, ah, that's reasonable. That's reasonable faith. It's verifiable. There's eyewitnesses. It's historical. I've seen people sit in these seats and I've seen people walk into the grocery store and come out alive. I've seen people eat school lunch and come out. They might go to the bathroom later, but they, they, uh, they made it. Well, let's apply the same test of the resurrection. Is it verifiable? Well, there were eyewitnesses. Over 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus. It's historical. Everything changes because no one did what Jesus did. He rose from the dead. It's historical. It, it happened. And, and other non-gospel writers have recorded this actually happened. So faith, yes, but it's reasonable. And then Thomas responded to him. And I don't know if Thomas went and touched him. We, we, what we have recorded here is that Thomas responded. He says, my Lord and my God. Would you say it with me? My Lord and my God. This phrase is used over a thousand times in the Old Testament scriptures about God himself. And I don't know what Thomas's response. I don't know if he poked or prodded or if he just came and he's like, oh, you're enough. My Lord and my God, he makes a declaration of faith that is not recorded in any other gospel record. He says, my Lord and my God. 
And my prayer and my hope is that you would have a Thomas moment. Maybe this morning, maybe it's a week from now, or if God tarries or you're, he allows oxygen to continue to flow through your lungs, that you would come to a moment where you realize that Jesus is enough, that he's the only one that gives you peace that passes all understanding. He's the only one that gives you purpose for today and purpose for forever. That you would come to a place like Thomas did, where Thomas goes from curious, like, ah, I'm not real sure, to committed my Lord and my God. He goes from doubt. Uh, I'm not real sure if this actually happened to, oh, this is a declaration, my Lord and my God. He goes from puzzled to perfect peace and purpose, my Lord and my God. There is no one like you. No one can do what you've done. You are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the and the end. In you alone do I place my faith, my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't refute it. Every time Jesus is worshipped, He receives it, which again further declares that He is the God of gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no other like Him. And then Jesus said, Because you have seen Me, you have believed. And some some of you who have Thomas temperament, you would say, Ah, yeah, but I just need to see you to believe it. Okay, well, I'm going to pray that God would show up for you in a way that's just as significant. I've been praying that God would show up to you in a way that is just as supernatural, that is just as specific. And I've been hearing stories from different ones of you. Someone would say, someone said, hey, you know what, I, I, I was praying and I had these invitation cards to come to Life Point and I, I wasn't real sure, but I gave it to a guy and, and he said, you know what, this is crazy that you would give this to me, is that just the other day in the grocery store, someone behind me who I'd never met before said, hey, do you go to church anywhere? And then you come up with this invitation card. I was like, oh, I, I wonder if God's trying to get my attention. And maybe God will show up for you in a grocery store. Maybe God will show up through to you through a coworker or a neighbor or a classmate. Or maybe God will show up to you on the side of the There's a pastor preaching right now who surrendered my Lord and my God to King Jesus on the side of the road. God showed up for him in a significant and supernatural way. That's what Jesus says next. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Apparently, according to Jesus, not everyone gets a see it to believe it kind of a moment. But he can and he does and maybe he will for you. But my prayer is that you would come to the place where you understand that believing in Jesus follows incredible blessing whether you see it the way that you want to see it or he just shows up in a way that he wants you to see him. That, that, that Jesus says that blessed are those who have not seen and believe. I want every single person at the sound of my voice online or on campus, I want you to be blessed by believing in Jesus. Now, I get in the Old Testament scriptures, the idea of blessing accompanied a financial blessing and, and uh, an expansion of property and legacy and, and, and land. But when Jesus uses the term blessing, it's actually far better than a car in the parking spot or an IRA or a bank account number. It is a promise that far supersedes any of those things. It's a promise that is, that is fulfilled by Jesus and by believing in Him. When Jesus talked about being blessed, in one of His most memorable sermons in Matthew chapter 6, He talks about the Beatitudes. He says, Blessed are you that are peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then He says, Blessed. Blessed are you because you will be called children of God. That's blessing. Blessed are you when you see God. That's blessing. Blessed are you when you're comforted. That's blessing. Blessed are you when you are filled with righteousness because you've been hungering and thirsting for the goodness of God. Blessed are you. But you will have a great reward in heaven, the Scripture says. And more than any of the things that Jesus gives... The great blessing of believing in Jesus is not the stuff that you get, but it's who you get. That you get the presence of God who gives you peace in the midst of storm, purpose in the midst of uncertainty. And so as we get ready to wrap up, I want to invite you to trust in Jesus today. I want to invite you to lean into Him 
And, and maybe he's shown up for you. Maybe you're a person who's been walking with Jesus for a while, but just like the disciples, you feel locked in fear. Anxiety, bouts of depression, uncertainty about your future or your job transition or the relationship that you're in. And maybe Jesus wants to just come to you. Jesus coming for you in love, saying, peace be with you. Some of you, you're wondering about your purpose. Maybe you've got a career as an engineer or an architect or a custodial worker or a teacher or a stay-at-home parent, and that's your career, that's your calling. And what if you just need to be understand that you are sent by Jesus to disciple those kids, to love people in the workplace with the love of Jesus, to mentor those students with the love and the heart as, as, a, as a disciple of Jesus, that He would breathe purpose into your career, into your calling. And maybe if you've walked in today with uncertainty about your eternity, maybe this is your opportunity to reach out to Jesus and to know that He's already been reaching out for you. Faith, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, is, is being certain of what we hope for. It's the evidence of what we do not yet see. And so my prayer, our prayer, our hope, is that you would come to know Jesus as your Lord, your Savior, and your God. Here at LifePoint Church, we talk about the ABCs. A, admitting our sin. Admitting that we are not perfect. That this church is perfect until you and I walked in the door. And then we became an imperfect church full of imperfect people. Chasing after a God who loves us perfectly despite our imperfections. We admit that we have sinned. And that heaven is perfect and we are not. And the only way that we can get there according to Jesus is by believing in Him. By believing that He died on the cross and then He rose from the dead. And then see committing our lives to Him. And so maybe you're ready to do that today. Maybe today you're going to raise your hand in the way that Thomas maybe reached out for Jesus. And maybe you walked in today with uncertainty and the Scriptures make it clear that those who believe in Jesus, if they confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord, they will be saved. Maybe you're going to be like the several other people in the room earlier today who raised their hand and said yes to Jesus and said, yeah, yeah, today is the day that I turn from my sin and I turn to Jesus as my Savior by admitting sin, believing in Jesus, and committing my life to Him. So what I want to do as we get ready to close and sing a worship song about the living hope that He offers is just to give you a chance to respond. Maybe now is your Thomas moment where God is showing up for you. Maybe it was through something someone said in the parking lot or the foyer or a lyric from a song that we sang, or from a scripture that was read, or a prayer that was prayed. And maybe this is your day to declare that Jesus is your Savior, your Lord, and your God. Maybe for the first time, or for the first time in a long time. So I'm going to pray for you, and then give you a chance to raise your hand and respond. Heavenly Father, I pray those online or those on campus that are being drawn by your love, your love that came for them in love. God, that they would surrender to you and reach out for you. Have your way. In Jesus' name. So if you're responding to the love of Jesus, by admitting sin, believing in Jesus, committing your life to Him. I'm going to count to three and I'm going to invite you to raise your hand as a symbol of surrender. You're pulling a Thomas. You're reaching out for Jesus to find out He's already been reaching out for you. You're placing the weight of faith of your life on His sacrifice on the cross and His power from an empty tomb. So that's you. I'm going to count to three and you throw, the, throw your hand up if that's you today. For the first time or first time in a long time. One, two, three. Throw your hand up if you're saying yes to Jesus today for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Put it up. Put it up big. 
Put it up big. You're in a safe room. Amen. See those hands. See your hand. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to pray to God. If you're not sure what to do or how to say that, you can just simply repeat after me. And I get it. As you have your hand raised, you're like, if I pray this out loud, other people are going to hear me. You're not going to be the only one praying. There's people around you that are going to join you in this prayer. They've prayed it before. They're going to pray it again with you, our new friends and family members in the faith. If you would, repeat after me as we pray. Dear God, I admit that I've sinned. I believe that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. I believe that he conquered death by rising from the dead. I'm turning from my sin and I'm turning to you, my Savior, my Lord, and my God. I am yours. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. I commit my life to you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we stand together and give God praise for several people who said yes to Jesus today? God is so good. God is so good. He loves you so much. If you made a decision for Jesus today, I don't want you to leave without talking to somebody, whether it be a prayer team member up here or one of our pastors in the back. She, one of our pastors is a gift for you if you made a decision for Jesus. Here's the deal. We're going to celebrate Jesus as our living hope. We're going to lift his name up with power. We're going to lift his name up with promise. And we're going to lift up his name with hope. Now, we're going to worship but I heard uh, that there are a lot of you that are like double and triple parked in the parking lot. And there's a lot of you that are going to practice the peace of God on your way out to the people of God on the way out. There's people that are going to be living with the peace of God as they wait to pick up their kids. We've got one more service that's coming in here, and we don't want them to uh, turn their back on Jesus on their way into the parking lot, all right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship. If you got a roll, you can roll. If you want to stay in worship, you stay in worship. But here's the deal. I want us to live with the peace and the purpose of God. Lift his name up big in here and around the world. So I'm going to pray. You can stay in worship. You can roll and worship. But we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you are, all that you've done, and all that you have yet to do. Thank you, God, that love left a mark on you and your love has left a mark on us. So, Father, may we be filled with the peace and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. How great the chasm that lay between Oh,
shake or a fist bump, go in the peace and the purpose of a God who's not finished with you yet. Can't wait to see you next week.